Hi, I'm Chris Kraft. I live, work, and play in Irmo, South Carolina, a suburb of Columbia, the heart of South Carolina. I want to talk today about STEM education. We could talk about STEM, we could talk about STEAM, we could talk about STREAM. Name your acronym. I think it bears a little further discussion. Several years ago, I was a Spanish teacher. I was originally certified just in K-12 Spanish. That's how I got into teaching. I actually became a teacher as a result of an alternative certification in South Carolina called PACE, the Program for Alternative Certification. So I got into a Spanish teaching classroom a little more than 10 years ago and knew nothing about what it meant to teach. Fast forward a couple of years later, I earned my national boards and they came to me and said, would you be willing to teach a different class? And eventually that morphed into the class that I now teach called Introduction to STEM. So I came to STEM teaching by a, a, a reasonably unorthodox path. So I began to explore STEM and I thought to myself, why is STEM even a thing? Here's why I asked that question. If you look at just the S on the left side and the M on the right, and I don't mean to to discount STEAM or STREAM. We'll get there in just a second. But if we look at the S and the M in STEM, they come from fundamentally epistemologically different backgrounds. In a science class, if you get the wrong answer, where wrong is in air quotes, then more than likely either you jacked up the experiment instructions or your hypothesis was simply wrong. Now, my mom was a math teacher for the better part of 35 years and taught upper-level high school math so advanced I couldn't quite understand it. And she would tell me when I asked her for help in my algebra classes early in high school that if I got the wrong answer, it's because I did something wrong in the problem. In other words, in a math class, a wrong answer is objectively wrong. But in a science class, a wrong answer potentially indicates either new knowledge or messed up experimentation, two fundamentally different epistemological standpoints. So I tried to resolve those as I began a, a, a career, hopefully, of teaching STEM, and I figured out that ultimately it's not about me, it's not even about our kids, it's about how we can impact the rest of our world. So to me, taking the S and the M and the potential paradox there became a non-issue when I figured out it's not about us and it's not about the acronym. It's not about whether it's STEM, STEAM, or STREAM. It's about what we can do together, me, my kids, you, your kids, whomever, to change our world. Let me give you a few examples of how that works. In my STEM class, we have a tagline. We look for real solutions to real problems. I want my students and yours to be thinking critically about their lives and about their worlds and about their community and about what they see around them. Because the reality is, with technology as advanced as it is, with Arduino and with Raspberry Pi and with 3D printing and all of the amazing things at our fingertips, why can't we be the ones to make real change? To that end, we've created a couple of projects that I think bear mentioning. A couple years ago, I had a student whose grandfather couldn't see very well, and he couldn't hear very well. So we took a kit that we had, and we repurposed it, and we built a pressure-sensitive, uh, quote-unquote, doorbell. The way it works is anytime he was, uh, the grandfather lived in an assisted living facility. So we put a pressure pad on the outside of the door. We put a little fan next to his couch so that in the event that he was sleeping, because Grandpa likes to nap, in the event that he was sleeping, the... When someone came to visit, it would gently blow in his face. And in the event that he was up, we put a flashing light, a real solution to a real problem. A little later, last school year, we got a visit. This is the tail end of 2013. We got a visit from a local sheriff's deputy who's a canine uh, handler. And he told us something very interesting, but at the same time very concerning. He said that more police dogs die every year because they're left in hot cars than they do from bad actions of criminals. One of my kids said, we have got to find a way to fix that. Well, we think we have. We built a digital dog collar with an Arduino, with a GPS, and with a, a temperature sensor and a light. So now we hook this onto the dog's canine collar. So there's a special bulletproof canine collar that they wear. We hook this on. We attach the temperature sensor to the particular spot where the dog is most sensitive for temperature. We calibrated it to the Belgian Malinois that we're using for our example. And it reads the temperature and warns the canine handler whether the dog is getting too hot. In addition, we can track the dog's location. 
So in a training scenario, we can see where the dog has gone and we can see where the handler has gone and the quote unquote criminal and we can improve, hopefully, help improve the training and the tracking of canines. One more quick project to tell you about. This school year, we learned that there was somebody in our community that did not have enough money for a prosthetic hand. We got in touch with Enabling the Future and learned how to 3D print prosthetic hands. Make a long story short, we 3D printed a prosthetic hand for this young girl in our community. We delivered it to her, and she said to us that now she can carry her school books without fear of them falling on her feet. At the tail end of this school year, we actually held a handathon and we assembled 26 prosthetic hands that we're sending all around the world. Real solutions to real problems. That's what I think STEM education really is.